Hello ladies and gentlemen, Panzer here, and I've just been playing the Warhammer and Titans Vermintide closed beta, and got a couple of thoughts to share on it, specifically with what it's shaping up to be like and what I think should be good for when it eventually launches. It'll be coming on October 23rd, I believe, so keep your eyes peeled for that. But to talk about what this game is, what this rat smashing, rat stabbing, rat burning sort of game is. Uh, I've got a special guest with me today. Uh, so say hello to the lovely Tiny Pixels, also known as Pip. Hello. Hi. So, Pip, we've just been playing Vermintide. So, uh, yep, we've been smashing up lots of rats, burning, burning lots. Of, there's lots of burning rats going on. Um, yeah, I I'm think glad we, we don't have sm smell of vision. Yeah, we can yeah. still smell them. It's uh, riveting. It's the sort of smell you I'm want glad. to wake up to. It's energizing, invigorating. But so we look I'll at. I stick to like energy drinks, thanks. I don't like the smell of energy drinks. They smell like burnt rats. Anyway, so <laughs> we we like the game, yeah. I mean, overall, I I I'm really enjoying it. What do you think so it's... far? So it's actually really good fun. Um, I have stepped away from uh sort of co-op games for a little while. And it's a really fresh take on the same formula that things like Left 4 Dead 2 have. Um, it's genuinely difficult and it's genuinely punishing when that friend, and we all have that friend, just kind of wanders off in a separate direction. Which is kind of what you want from a co-op game, really. You want it to push the, the sort of co-op aspect. Um, it does a, a lot, a lot of things right. There are a couple of things that it needs to, to fix. Uh, but it does a lot of things right um, on being a, a co-op game. Yeah, I think in particular one of the things we can definitely agree that it is doing right is the whole melee combat focus. Because of course there is there is a lot of melee combat going on in this game. Every character of course has a ranged weapon, which is different for each class of course. But the melee combat itself. Now, the last time I played a melee combat game that was so heavily into that aspect of the combat was Chivalry Medieval Warfare. And the, what I enjoyed about that was the whole tactics and strategy, kind of knowing where to hit, when to hit, uh, and from which direction. Now, when I, when I started playing Vermintide, what I gathered from this was it, it does have those elements, like, you're not going to see feints and you're not going to see parries and all that going on necessarily in the same way. But what I notice is the positioning you play, how far away when you start to strike, um, what sort of timing you need to plan uh, for your swing. All of that comes into play really strongly in Vermintide and I think it really adds to that whole atmosphere because of course you can't really take too many hits, can you? No, it's, 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 it, it certainly is punishing. Uh, for me, what it is, is because we're dealing with rats, right? And, and we have to remember all times, we're, we're dealing with them and we're dealing with rats and you expect rats to swarm. If you don't understand the timing, the blocking, the shoving away, the long strikes, the short strikes, if you don't understand that, you're going to get overwhelmed so fast. Uh, and it happened to us in our first couple of plays where we were all like, oh look, we have ranged weapons! And suddenly everything was on top of us, beating us down. And it does, it beats you down. And where it's got that Left 4 Dead system that um, your friends have to come and pick you back up again, if you are absolutely surrounded, they cannot get to you, you are going to die. Um, so that whole timing aspect, the, the making sure that as you run onto an enemy, you are sort of at an apex of swing rather than you swing just before you make contact. Um, the fact that your blocks have to be on point, but you're not blocking everything and then swinging. It, it's it's very it's a very clever system, and it's less cluttered than the chivalry system. And I mean, I'm going to call it cluttered because there were a million and one things for me to remember that I was never going to remember. Um, but it's not just left click to win. You yeah. really do have to kind of get get behind it, get behind the timings and thinking. And each separate class behaves slightly differently. And in that, each weapon for each different class behaves differently. So you really have got to find a build uh, and a character or a pool of characters and a pool of weapons 
that really suit the way that you play. Um, and it's really clever and it pushes you to play more because obviously, you know, finishing missions, you roll new equipment and what have you. Um, so it's really clever in that, that um, it's not an overly complicated system, but it's complicated enough for you to keep dipping out, for you to keep trying new weapons, new characters, all that sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. And we're getting on to the actual classes themselves now. Every car class, of course, behaves very, very differently. So for me, I started off playing the soldier and I wasn't expecting that sort of level of timing and strategy to the actual combat that I got caught pretty badly off guard because the soldier carries a, well, by default anyway, a big two-handed warhammer. Now, this is a very slow to swing weapon, but it has armor piercing. It does pretty big amounts of damage uh, with a single swing but because you've got that lead up time you, you really have to start your swing at a distance and make sure it connects or you're gonna have that recovery time kicking in and that's where you're gonna get hit one thing that I noticed as well is that the Skaven actually have a decent amount of melee range on them because a lot of them carry spears or long hafted blades and they can actually hit you from further away than you're expecting but balancing that out you can also have a much greater reach than you would expect from a first-person game. One thing's for sure, I wasn't expecting to connect with the target until I was right up in their face. But in Vermintide, you actually have a decent reach, and it's something that you need to kind of get used to when you first play it. So getting that timing is a little bit trickier as well, simply because you've got that extra reach that you don't expect to have there. And then we get on to things like attack speed, of course, uh, some of the characters attack much faster than others and then there's also the charged attacks which have different effects so as you might expect as well the characters that attack really quickly seem to only be able to hit one target at a time or a couple of them very close together but then you go to characters like the soldier or even the bright wizard with the sword can hit a much wider arc than uh, some of the faster hitting characters so and, and even in there even in there so uh, one of the ones that does pretty much single target melee damage um, is your your ranger character, um, who is kind of uh, is kind of styled more in a in a rogue sort of way with dual blades. That you go in, you quickly take out you know the the, the targets at the front to be able to shoot down the targets at the back, and um, even that. Uh, as you start to unlock new weapons, you can balance out that speed versus arc, uh, sort of how many uh, how many targets you can hit at once. So, although we're saying classes work like this, there's actually a lot of flexibility to it the more that you play. Um, and I think players are going to find themselves looking for particular sets of weapons, building themselves certain things. Not because those things are good, uh, but building those things because they suit them. Yeah. Um, that's that's going to be a, a really major thing. And I think that adding on to that level of flexibility as well, the loot drops themselves, the different stats of the different weapons that you get, and of course going after the really rare ones, uh, will definitely keep players kind of coming back simply because maybe there's a better weapon that suits this class for your particular playstyle or maybe there's a particularly nice looking one like there's that level of sort of gambling that goes on because of course the looting system is a literally throwing a die and seeing what you get so in the same way that you have those case openings in games like CSGO you have that sort of random factor and hoping that you get the next better thing it can be made slightly less random uh, by collecting stuff within the world but in a lot of ways the worlds push you forward the, the levels that we played push you forward so you you can only ever expect to have like standard dice um and with roles not being class specific um it, it's very clever in that it might get you to play something just outside of your comfort zone because oh look i had a new sword for this class that i don't play but you know maybe i'll give it a go it's um it's, it's clever in that yeah, at the very least it gets you to look, and I think that that is a very smart choice. Um, simply because, yeah, it only it really only shows you an icon, or at least the art of the weapon. It doesn't show you like what it actually looks like on the character, or how it's going to be used, or how it's going to play. And that leaves the player without too many preconceptions about how the things that they get from the loot drops are actually going to work. And I think that's really, really smart. 
simply because it gets you to at the very least go and check out what you just got. Go and have a look at it. And that might even just entice you to play that class. Very smart choice there. So, now that we've talked about what we like, what are the things we don't like? So... Uh, can I can I can I talk really briefly um about a choice of failure music? Yeah. Because I know some of the people that we played with um were like, oh no, this is growing on me now, and yeah, it feels like I really fa No, it sounds like a bunch of people have thrown some pots around and going, Yeah, no, this sounds great, it's modern as hell, let's go for that. Um it's it's no. No, please change that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you agree with me or not. I don't know if you were with the guys who were like, oh no, this is starting to grow on me and I feel like I failed. No, it sounds like a three-year-old has been let loose in your kitchen with 12 wooden spoons and 60 pans. <laughs> it's... Oh, no. I think as well, like, it doesn't help that at the moment in the beta, the failure music seems to be glitched in a way where it seems to get stuck. <laughs> and if it's being layered on, one of the layers is just going... It's just making constant static as though a section of it's being repeated. It, it doesn't help. I, I guess maybe if we had a chance to listen to the full track, maybe it's actually alright? I don't know, but at the moment I've not actually heard the full track. I really don't know if it's something I'd like or not. I get that they're going for this sort of medieval gothic kind of sound to it, where it's very gloomy and very dark and grim, and... To a certain degree, when you look at games that have that, they have a similar sort of sound to them. But I'm not sure exactly what they they're going with here because I can't really hear it too clearly, and that's kind of kind of a shame. I mean, when we talk about the music itself, the, the oh, rest the of sound it... design is gorgeous. It's so yeah. clever, and it fits the aesthetic down to the ground. They've got uh, the rest of the sound design that's in the game, so we're missing things like water sound and leaf. Russell, so stuff that, that normally you take for granted. Uh, we're missing stuff like that. The rest of the sound design is so clever in that this, you know when there's something big arriving, you know when you've got a little lull to heal, uh, you know when you've got to keep pushing forward. Um, it, it's it's dynamic in that as you move in and out of caves, you, you understand the difference. Yeah. Um, everything else, even the, the, the slightly, the, the, you know, the, the hub world, the slightly cheery, uh, but a little bit dismal pub that you're in uh, is is really well done. But that, and I know it must sound like nitpicking, but the rest of it is so good, and that just lets the sound design down yeah. so far. That's why I'm kind of really hoping that that is either a work in progress or something that just maybe isn't working right now. Um, but yeah, no, like we're talking about the actual range of sounds, right? So there was this one mission. Uh, which is a very sh short one uh, at this current stage, but y it takes place on a sort of ruins of a castle or castle ramparts. And when you enter the actual castle, there's a lot of echoing and there's a lot of sort of banging on the walls. The way uh, the sounds sort of are morphed in a way, like it, we understand that it's the same sort of sounds that the Scar uh, Skaven normally make. Uh, but because it's oh. in that environment, it makes it twisted and warped in a way because of the echoing and because of the way that it's being distorted through the environment that really adds to the atmosphere. Even in that level, uh, you can hear whispers and things um, as if there's something sort of more sinister and more dark going on in that level. Um, that entire thing put me on edge. Um, although it was a very short section, that entire section really did put me on edge, and I, I, I genuinely made me feel uncomfortable. Like we had to get that done and get out. That's the thing as well with the whole whispering and all that, because the Skaven are ambush predators. They like to attack when your back is turned. And one thing I noticed, it wasn't actually just in that level. In the first level in the town, when you're passing through the actual village itself you start hearing those in certain areas as well. I noticed it a couple of times, and it's partly as well because the Skaven appear to come down from the rooftops, or from the windows. And a few times I actually turned around to see if they were behind me at that point, because you hear a whisper from somewhere above you. 
And there was nothing there, of course, but it really adds to that whole, they're all around you, they're all coming to get you, that sort of level of paranoia that, that keeps you kind of wanting to move and stick with the group. It's not so much that, it's, you know, it's horror game scary, but it's more that no, but I don't know where they're coming the, from. The level of immersion there is so, so spot on. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. And that we can see so clearly in this, uh, in, in just the small sample of levels that we have, that it's very clear that uh, Fat Shark know what sort of uh, aesthetic they want, and they know what kind of feeling they want to get out of each particular environment. And if they keep this up, they're going on the right track, I'd say. Now, uh, I do want to talk about peer-to-peer -peer connectivity a little bit, because this game relies pretty much entirely on that uh, at this stage. I don't know if there are plans to have dedicated servers in the way that Left 4 Dead and um, basically the Source games have, or have had in the past. But peer-to-peer -peer connectivity and all that works really well when you, you have friends that you play with frequently. You understand how far everyone is, and you sort of can tolerate that sort of level of lag that you normally get. Granted, though, in Vermintide, the lag is really not noticeable in any significant capacity. It does happen from time to time, but it's not really very noticeable. But I will no, say, I mean, we... it, it does have an issue um, when you're going to connect with random players, for example. Uh, if you have one person that's lagging and you can't communicate with them and you can't get them to work with you, that extra little bit of thing where, because, yeah, it's going to have to compensate for them, you're going to have that extra level of just uh, frustration with that player because of that constantly happening. And I think that's a really serious problem because it happens with games like Call of Duty uh, that have peer-to-peer. -peer. One person lags, everybody seems to lag, and it just ruins the experience for everyone else too. So that's my beef with it. I mean, with the inclusion of all the range and everything, we didn't see a, a hell of a lot go wrong, um, even though you're quite a, a way away from me. Um, I had a couple of rats, you know, scoot sideways across the level, and at one point we were all like waist deep in the elevator, as opposed to being stood on it. Mm -hmm. uh, but nothing that was, you know, game breaking or, or ruining. Um, I mean, it has an in game chat to be able to compensate for, hey, so how's your internet looking, buddy? But we all know the internet's not that friendly a place. Um, yeah, it's, it's it's most definitely going to lead to some kind of frustration if the matchmaking isn't um, kind of local. It's it's sad because genuinely the, the gameplay is so rewarding whenever you come together and do things. Um, I have a, I do have this horrible feeling though that that if if it remains that way, we're going to get some pretty annoyed players because the second that those ogres warp halfway across the map, that's it. I'm done. I'm out. I'm finished. Nope. Yeah. You know? Um, and that's the thing as well when we talk about the certain enemy types as well. It, it, having uh, at least a competent level of lag compensation goes a long way. We talk about just not even just the ogre, but we talk about the armoured enemies. The fact that you have to time a swing for a lot of the characters, for example, the Witch Hunter yep. has that rapier and it has a, an armor-piercing stab. Uh, you need to time that, even if it's very fast. And the same goes with the soldier and basically any character with armor-piercing. If you have to charge up attack, you need to have that, that swing connecting when it needs to connect. And that's really an issue when there are enemy types that require it to, to be able to defeat them. Not just to make it easier, but to actually defeat them at all, um, without you know losing half your team, mm. you're going to need it. And those guys, they come in a group. They're not going to be by themselves all the time. They come in a group. Um, mind you, though, they do come in a very stylized fashion with their marching in and all that, like legionnaires, <laughs> which is very, very cute. And I actually like that. Them marching into the middle of the field. Um, yeah, each each character's design is is really really clever. Uh, they've really thought about their escaping classes a lot. Um, even things down to things like the um, and again, this is going to be a problem with peer to peer. I think uh, is the the gas rats that uh, become very agitated and start running around and screaming, and then they explode. And I can just imagine being stood there and going, "All right, gas rat, yeah, I need to." Oh, oh, hello. 
uh, as it explodes on my face out of nowhere. Um, yeah. That, again, yeah. Uh, they, they're really going to have to sort of look at that kind of thing. But if you're playing with friends and you all understand that, you know, you, uh, you come from different areas, it, it's not going to be such a big deal. But for people who haven't got, you know, a team of four to go forward, it's, it's going to be a little bit tough. Well, I think definitely where I know where I'm going to be, and I'm going to be dragging people along to play with me. Because that's the thing about co-op games, is that I just generally prefer playing it with, with people I know, but I can understand that, the, you know, not everybody um, will have the option of pulling people as and when to play. But at the same time, there are people who would just genuinely also just like to play with random players, public matches. There's nothing really wrong with that, but, you know, to each their own. So, mm -hmm. I guess what I'm hoping to see once the game is out, I mean, we're talking about 13 levels at launch, uh, maybe more in future, who knows. Uh, but what I'm hoping to see when it's done is, we were talking earlier as well about the water not making any sounds and the leaves rustling and all that. There's, um, maybe a little bit more um, emphasis on terrain, I think. Since we uh, we already are well aware that the Skaven do make use of terrain to their advantage, so hopefully there could be a way for players to do the same. Things like dampening of footsteps on certain surfaces, like for example, are you going to walk in wood in the houses, or walking through water, is that going to attract more attention uh, versus just walking in the sand? You know, that sort of no, thing no, I would see. There's hints of that. In the so uh, while we were playing the the press beta on the left hand side, we had a constant raft of tips. Did you know that you have a melee weapon? Did you know that you have a ranged weapon? Did you know that you can spit? And that that yeah, a way to turn that off would be great in future things. Um, but one of them was that um, uh, that the Skaven could hear you uh, if 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 you made a lot of noise. They were attracted to to lots of of sound and action. So we sat there and we thought, all right, well, we'll try crouching through water and we'll try walking through water and crouching on land and walking around land. And it honestly didn't feel like there was a huge difference. Yeah. It, uh, it genuinely didn't feel like there was a huge difference. And that upset me a little bit, but it looks like they've got plans to put that in. Um, it would be a really nice addition considering there are multiple paths to get to, or in some of the levels. Um, there were multiple paths to be able to get to where we were going. Yeah, um, I, I did notice that as well. And uh, looking at how close these sort of pathways were, it, it's entirely probable as well. Or even uh, sometimes maybe advisable to move the team in pairs down these paths too. That, that's another viable option as well. Looking at the way they've laid it out, there definitely seems to be uh, advantage and disadvantage to different ones. Like one example, yeah, we go to the third mission that we played, right? That's in the swamp area. So the first time we went through that, we went straight ahead uh, and the pathway led directly into the swamp. Now the other option went to a slightly higher ground. It was a narrower pathway and it seemed to be a lot, um, I guess, quieter or a, sort of a sneaky entrance. But that gave you uh, a height advantage because, of course, the Skaven are going to have to climb up to get to you. So there, you know, there it gives you a bit of variety in play. It gives you a different way of getting to where you need to go and a different way of, you know, killing the enemies when you get there. So, of course, one one suggestion I could probably do for that sort of situation is maybe put the rangers up on the top and then have the melee guy go go in the middle, you know. There are there's so many different ways of doing that just because they've given you that option and it's really nice to see. We're, we're talking about linear maps, of course, where it's a start to end, it's always going to start in, in, in the same place, but having multiple pathways really helps to break up um, the, the gameplay itself and give you more replayability. It got us thinking as well, and that's something that I haven't had from a, a, a co-op game, or, or indeed a game for a little while, um, is it got us thinking. Uh, so we'd fail the mission once, because, I mean, the game is genuinely difficult. It is genuinely difficult. Uh, the the curve is, is something special on its own, but provided you play it at the right modes, it, the game is genuinely difficult. So we got us thinking about, okay, so if we go up there, we are in a big open area, but we're on the ground. What happens if we go this way? And it happened at a couple of points. Um, in the first level, we could get up above uh, a hog pit instead of walking down through the middle of it. Um, there were a couple of points where we could walk across rooftops 
uh, and, and through buildings instead of just around them. And then in the swamp, there were these different paths that went up and down across various sort of faces. So they clearly looking at that as a um, as a way to get players to, to think about mechanical advantage and class advantage. And it, it, it genuinely got us thinking and that was good. That was a really good thing. Yeah, and then one thing to point out as well, talking about the different class advantages and disadvantages, we look at class synergy as well, we, because we, we have some melee-focused classes and we have ranged-focused classes in there. Or, or, it could be, you know, that it's not really focused on that. It depends on the player how they want to play that character, obviously. But if you're going to go in favouring melee um, and somebody else is ranged, then you kind of have to work together in a way. One thing that we noticed as well, and of course I hope that this is probably just a work in progress uh, effect that's going on. But when we fire off the soldier's blunderbuss, in certain areas it kicked up so much dust that if you fire that near to a player uh, who happens to be standing in that area, it would kick up so much dust that they wouldn't be able to see for at least half a second. And that's a pretty big deal when the Skaven come at you in, in swarms really, really fast. So it's something that you need to kind of coordinate, but at the same time it could be a work in progress effect. Uh, at the same time, of course, we talk about things like shot blocking. You know, if you if you have somebody that's in the face of um, a big enemy, you can't take the shot because they're blocking it because their back's to you and all that sort of thing. So again, kind of working together with the different classes does come into play quite significantly in this. Um, the poor dwarf, though. The poor <laughs> dwarf is always going to be picked. He's never going to get a break. Um, I mean, at the moment, he's the best blocking that we can see. He's the best tank that we can see. And honestly, you can't... I say you can't be without a tank. It was more difficult for us... And that might just be because we're bad. I don't know. But it was more difficult for us to get through it without our little dwarven buddy, without some kind of tanky presence. Um, we played with the classes a lot in that I, uh, I was really naughty and the ranger who was meant to be taking out things, you know, silently from range, uh, I would use swords constantly, the dual blades just constantly. I decided I was a rogue instead. Um, the second that we had um, a, a friend of ours in as, as the bright mage, um, he would constantly be spamming his charge attack. So he was the slowest mage that I had ever come across. But there was no way to get around not having our dwarf. He was tank. He was constantly tank. And that's what he did. And it didn't matter who played him. Yeah. He was constantly tank. And of course, key to that, we talk about his shield blocking mechanic, uh, where every block has a certain sort of block value so of course if you parry with a weapon you have a block value of maybe three but the shield of course brings that up to five so in some cases that's a lifesaver I, I really like actually the way that um, the blocking works in this game because you can't block forever it, it will punish you if you try to just block everything because once that stamina meter runs out you can't block for a period of time you're going to take hits and you're not going to be expecting it you know it will just shatter and you'll be stuck there without a guard uh, and by that time you're surrounded so <laughs> good luck to you if you try doing that so it, it's an interesting way that it works and I think we only saw this once or twice uh, when we were playing it even with the group but with the certain enemy types when they lunge at you particularly the gutter runner which is kind of like the hunter from Left 4 Dead. If you strike at the right time, you can actually counter his pounce, which is something you couldn't do in Left 4 Dead. Once you saw the hunter and he jumps on you, you didn't really have a counter on your own. You needed somebody to come and save you. Mm. And with the gutter runner, if you if you see him quick enough, you you hit that strike as soon as he comes in. You could knock him right back off you. And that was really interesting to see uh, that you had that sort of last ditch defense to kind of keep yourself going but of course you know once you're down then it's just sit there and scream for your teammates to come and save you <laughs> and scream we did um no i i remember that moment actually because i was the one that found it where i turned around and me me and a little assassin rat we locked eyes for a second um and i realized what was going on uh and i think it was at that point i started to scream and press left click wildly um, 
Because it is, it's genuinely panicking. Something to note about him, though, is that he misses. Yes. Which is kind of neat. It, it, it's, it's... it's kind of endearing as well, because, you know, we're talking about gu they're trying to kill you, they're vicious rats that are trying to kill you. But at the same time, you know, they're slightly incompetent as well. So, um, he's like a highly trained assassin, and then he comes in and just completely misses. Like, you'll see him go sailing right past your face, because he's just missed you. Uh, there's something really kind of endearing about that, that the AI does make mistakes. You know, that the enemies are not not that good at their jobs. Uh, like, for example, um, and this has been said as well in many interviews with the developers, uh, everywhere as well, like, one thing that the Skaven do is they don't attack you alone. They, they will try to run away. And in some cases with the AI, that causes some really funny effects. In fact, <laughs> what we saw recently was uh, one of the Skaven was well ahead of the group for whatever reason. He charged in on his own, saw the Bright Wizard, and jumped off the bridge. Just straight away, jumped right off the bridge. <laughs> uh, <laughs> just panic. Uh, and then tried to attack us from behind instead. Uh, there are all these little touches that that yeah. kind of make them a believable race. That they sort of live up to what they're supposed to be in the lore, and at the same time, sort of relatable. Like, you understand them, because they, they are afraid of you, and they're also trying to fight you. So it's a very sort of human-like, very relatable sort of personality about them, which I really like. The other thing is, and I mean, I... I... I, I want to believe that this isn't, uh, or oh, these aren't aren't glitches. I want to believe these are actual things that somebody sat down and went, wouldn't be cool if they did this. So I cornered one Skaven, right, uh, by a rock, and he began waving his arms as if to say, no, 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 please. <laughs> and I want desperately to believe that's not a glitch. Right? The other thing, and you, you mentioned this, was that um, while you were playing the, the soldier, one of them came up behind you and called you by name. Yeah, that was an interesting moment as well, because I was fighting off a group in front of me. Now, of course, if you were a player that was about to take me down, you wouldn't announce your arrival, you wouldn't make yourself known, you would have taken the chance to get a cheap shot in and run away. What this guy did was he taunted. He actually taunted me, and because I was playing the soldier, he actually said, Death to you, soldier man. Which... Although it could be, you know, just a piece of dialogue that's thrown out. It, it's not a piece of dialogue that would make sense being said to any other character. So it does make me wonder if they're going for character-specific enemy dialogue. Which would be really nice and very, very... It's a very nice touch uh, to have in there. But of course, that was the only instance I think we've heard of that. Or at least clearly heard of it. Because sometimes you, stuff gets lost amid the screams, really. Hmm. Um, but, I mean, we were looking at things like the interplayer dialogue um, and the fact that we would go into the, the woods, the, the um, sort of bog area, and um, the the bright mage would go, Hey, so I want to burn everything! And the, the ranger, the, the wood elf, the ranger would go, No, please don't. And then the second time we played that level, um, the wood elf would go, the trees are screaming. They know that they've been invaded. And the dwarf would go, I lots of rats here. <laughs> yeah. The, and it, the... was, it was this moment of, huh, these characters really do sort of, they know each other and they understand what they're saying. And it, it was a really nice touch. And if we get to see that from the enemies as well, that'll be really, really good. That'll make it that more immersive experience that already... Uh, the level design, although in some places a bit dark, and the sound design, although sometimes a little bit bashy, um, already gives us. There are all these little touches that are just... They really tie the game together. Yeah, I think that's something we both can definitely agree on. That we, When we go back to this whole idea of immersion, they, they have a setting and they have an, a universe in mind that they want to create and it's very very nice to see that that is actually coming together so yeah that basically we, that is Warhammer and times Vermintide I say I like it I think it's very uh, it's very immersive it's very fun to play very fun to play and I'm 
definitely looking forward to seeing more from this. Uh, what about you, Pip? Yeah, I mean, they've got to do a couple of bits and pieces to shake it up for me. Uh, things like the head bob and the sword bob has got to go. Uh, we've got to have an option to turn that off. But um, as far as sort of the game as it stands, uh, knowing that it's an early game, I can't wait to see the direction they take from it. They've got some really good ideas about um, not only a co-op experience, but um, a cohesive and immersive experience in a world that we don't live in. And it'll be interesting to see how far they carry those forward. All right, so there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. This has been Panzer and Pip taking a look at Warhammer and Times Vermintide. This, of course, is taken from the press closed beta. Uh, the open, or rather public, closed beta should be coming very soon, so keep an eye out for that. And, of course, October 23rd is when the game is coming out, so look forward to that. I know I will. And thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.